Hello and welcome to the lesson on resistive force, or also as known as the drag force, which will be the final type of friction we'll talk about. This is considered a type of friction. It is the resistance of an object trying to pass through a medium. And a medium could be anything from air to water and technically even a plasma. So it's the resistance of an object to passing through a medium. So there we have that again. The resistance of an object attempting to pass through a medium, air, water, things like that. The equation is over on your far left. Now, I've included the negative sign, and there's a key detail about this negative sign that it simply indicates the direction. So it's only there to make sure the direction is clear. In other words, if I have an object that's going this way, let's say its velocity is oriented this way, and we'll call that the positive direction, the resistive force acting on this object, if I was to draw a free by a diagram, would have to be opposite to the velocity. So R would have to point to the left in this case. The velocity is going to the right, so the air resistance that this object feels, or the resistive force this object feels, would have to point to the left. It has to point in the opposite direction. When we do calculations with this, which we unfortunately uh, don't necessarily have time to do calculations on just B and V, we'll do other calculations around it, the negative sign can be removed as long as you've shown the direction in the free by diagram. Now that does lead us to talking about what is B, and B is known as the resistive constant. And this resistive constant depends on a few things. It depends on the density of the medium. In other words, the more dense, the higher B will be. So things like water, which are definitely more dense than air, water will have a greater resistive constant than air. It also depends on the surface area of the object. And similar to the last one, the higher the value, the greater B is. In other words, the larger the surface area that you have exposed to this resistance, the greater the resistance there will be. So it basically is thinking about the idea like, uh, think about dropping a piece of paper. If I was to take a sheet of paper and drop it, it wouldn't really excel, it wouldn't really fall that fast. It wouldn't accelerate that fast either because that is a very large surface area as it's falling to the ground. If you take that exact same piece of paper and crumple it up into a ball and drop it, it obviously falls faster and it accelerates at a greater rate. The reason is because when it's flat, it has a huge surface area compared to when you crumple it into a ball, it has a much smaller surface area. V is for velocity, just like you may have already expected. Now, this means that velocity determines the resistance, which is interesting because that means the force depends on the velocity, and the force determines the acceleration, which impacts the velocity, which may sound confusing at first, but let's take it step by step. Let's look at the situation with our equation. You'll notice I got rid of the negative sign. We're not going to worry about the direction right now. I'm just going to talk about what's going on with these values. If I was to increase the surface area, in other words, I had a larger value for B, I would clearly have a larger value for R, right? So if I was to increase the surface area, B would increase, which has to increase R, because if I have a larger number here, like let's say it's 4, and last time it was 2, 4 times whatever V is gets a greater value than whatever 2 times V is. So we get a greater value. Whenever we have a larger value for B, we have larger resistance. Now think about it this way. In driving down the road, the faster and faster you go, what happens to the resistance? So if I increase V, I also have to increase the resistance. So in other words, the faster you go, the greater the resistance to your motion. That's kind of crazy. And it's actually why um, there, are, there are calculations out there to test this to figure out what the optimum speeds are for vehicles. And each vehicle is different because each vehicle has a different value for its air resistance. We'll talk about that in just a bit. But there's a certain point where you're driving so fast that the air resistance is high enough that you're not really getting a lot of efficiency out of your vehicle. You're wasting gas to the air resistance when you could actually go a little slower and not have as great of a resistive force to deal with and conserve gas and still get there at about the same time. Because when it comes down to it, uh, I know you're taught this in driver's ed, and it's quite accurate. Uh, if you want to go 10 miles per hour over the speed limit to get to your destination, you're not going to get there much faster than if you just drove the speed limit. It's, uh, there's calculations you can do to verify it, and really it's, it's quite true. So faster you go, you also have this greater resistance. So you're actually wasting gas on air resistance. Kind of silly thing. See, as we're talking about it, thinking about vehicles driving, this is kind of a general diagram to show you what the air currents would look like on a, say, a flat object, which clearly has a large surface area, this bus. And this large surface area 
means a much higher value for B, right? So this would mean that we have a higher B value, so therefore more resistance. So you have a greater resistance here because your B value is very small, or very large, sorry. Your B value is very large because of this great surface area in the front of the bus. So that's a problem. More resistance, which means you have more... You have to spend more gas to keep this object moving at the rate it's going to be moving at. Now, obviously, there are ways to streamline that. Now, buses are one thing. Like a car is designed to cut through the air. It's got a much lower surface area. So we've got a much lower surface area. So I'm saying SA as in surface area. And that means a much lower value for B. So R is lower, right? So essentially, when you have a more streamlined car, the goal you have is to have less resistance to the object going through the air. It allows it to get to its top speed faster, allows it to stay at that top speed without wasting gas on air resistance. And uh, yeah, it's also more fun. Obviously, a streamlined car tends to travel a little faster. People like that. Now, here's an interesting situation. So trucks, obviously, sh tr uh, shipping trucks, and this is kind of a generic version of one, have a fairly bad profile for surface area, because look at all this stuff here. This is a big flat front to the truck. Air currents are going to hit this and then have to bounce around it. That causes friction. That's a problem. That's a big surface area to cause friction on. And then it goes up to here, bounces off of there, and we have two really large areas that are problems on trucks. In our recent times, we've had to deal with gas prices rising. We've also had to deal with a recession, so... Uh, the amount of money gained has been pretty low, and shipping companies felt the crunch. And they started to look at ways to conserve gasoline so that they would save money on their vehicles. One of the solutions, which you've probably already seen, and obviously this is generally on large semis, is they added like a crest to this thing. So when the air hits the surface, it goes straight over, lowering the resistance value. Now, lowering the resistance value means you have to burn less gas to keep going at the rate that you're driving at. So that's kind of nice. That uh, lowered surface area allows them to save gas from air resistance. There's also been a push to put a, a larger nose on the vehicle and make it more aerodynamic. That way you don't have this flat front to it where air currents can kind of bounce and have to rise up off of. So, again, a less surface area, less exposed surface area, or a better streamlined shape to cut through the air with. The next solution, which hopefully you'll see when you're driving on the highway sometime, is what's called a semi-skirt. These things are designed to go between the back two wheels and the front of the trailer, and what happens is you usually have air currents, and I'm going to have to use a smaller truck to show this, you usually have air currents that will kind of get trapped inside this area, and they'll bump the, fr the tires here. That's a surface area that we have to deal with. That surface area causes resistance, and that resistance takes away from our efficiency when we're driving. Now, what you can do, you put this skirt in the way so that the air currents have no choice but to be deflected outwards, and they never reach the tires. So that surface area is never contacted, and you don't waste gas trying to resist pulling those tires forward because of the air resistance pushing on them. Now, why does this make a difference if you think about it this way? If somebody owns a fleet of trucks, and this will save you 1% uh, per gallon, well, that's 1% per gallon traveling for thousands of miles with all of the trucks they own. That 1% starts to become really nice after a while, after a very short while. And it turns out that these skirts that they purchase for the trailers cost less than the amount of money they tend to save. So overall, these investments have paid off and have allowed some companies to survive what people would have concerned almost a serious problem for the shipping industry when a recession hit and when gas prices rose. Looking here at the drag force, we got an alligator swimming in the water. There's two interesting things to think about here. We can think about the drag force as a blessing and a curse at the same time, a good and a bad thing. Because with the alligator's paws here, when the, alligator, when the alligator takes its paw, and let's just assume that this is an alligator paw, which is awful, I know, but I'm no artist. The alligator is pushing back on the water. So they're pushing with a force through the water. Because of Newton's third law, the water must push back equally and oppositely on the alligator's paw. Now that's a resistance. That is the resistance of the water to you pushing through it, or the alligator in this case. So what happens in this case? Well, the alligator is going to go forward because it just pushes the water backwards, and yeah, the water gets pushed backwards. It gets accelerated backwards. At the same time, 
the alligator is going to be pushed forwards, allowing it to go forward. So the areas, the resistance, sorry, the drag force here is a benefit. And obviously, alligator paws have, um, again, I apologize for this, it's awful art. They tend to have webbings on their paws. It looks pretty ugly. There we go. So uh, the fingers would have been like here, and there's webbings between it, right? Those webbings, you may have to picture this in your head better than me, but the webbings are what allow this to have a greater surface area. So you want this greater surface area with the water so you can pull more from the water. You can get more of a force pushing you forward. That's why creatures that tend to swim have webbings or fins to allow them to swim. Flippers. Now there's also another side to this though. Obviously you want greater resistance on the hands and feet for this crocodile or alligator to swim. But there's also another problem. This whole front of the crocodile is a surface area. And that surface area means that we have a resistance. So there's going to be a resistance to this alligator going through the water just based upon the surface area of its body. So creatures that tend to swim have really slim profiles and very aerodynamic shapes because they want to minimize the resistance of their body going through the water. But then they have these very large surface area things like uh, big tails on fish. And these large tails have a huge surface area. So think about R equals BV for these fish tails. The fish tail obviously is huge so that the fish can get a much better push. There we go. Rather than me trying to draw stuff the whole time, that's ugly. Well, look at this. Consider the fact that the fish is rather streamlined. If you looked at it from the front, they tend to just have this kind of goofy shape going on, which is great because it's very streamlined, low surface area. But the fins are big and flat, and that's a great, a large surface area, which means you have a high, you have a very large value for R on the fins, but a very low value for R when you look at the profile of the fish. So you want a high drag force to allow you to push through the water on the fins and on the hands like when we swim. But when you're trying to get through the water, you want a low surface area. This is why swimmers wear swim caps. If you had hair, and some people do or don't, I don't have a ton of it, but when you're swimming through the water and you have a lot of hair, that's a huge amount of surface area that you have to overcome. That's a large drag force that you have to overcome. It makes it harder for you to swim. So, people wear swim caps so they don't have to work as hard against all that hair. So they don't have to work as hard against all that surface area of hair that's going through the water. You're wasting less of your force just keeping yourself going. You're already streamlined enough to go through the water. Another thing to think about with the crocodile actually relates a little more to us than it. Actually, I think that's an alligator, but either way. When the alligator is swimming in the water, the depth that the alligator is at actually has a big impact, and it's the same thing for swimmers when they're in the water. The deeper you are in the water, like in this case, if we duck this thing down even further, there's much more resistance in the water, because keep in mind that uh, the R value, the uh, sorry, the B value, in other words, the resistive constant is much higher in water, it's a higher B in water, than in air. So, in other words, if you had to move through one of these two media, if you had to move through one of these two, which one would you choose? Well, you want to be moving through the air more because the air has a lower value. So, what the alligator may do or what a swimmer tends to try to do is to ride high in the water. They ride higher in the water so that more of their surface area is exposed to the air, which is a lower resistance, than the water, which has a higher resistance. Obviously, we return back to the first part here. Which one of these two objects falls faster? Well, that's a little trickier. The uh, Obviously, the surface area of the feather seems to be higher, but that's not quite right. It actually has a combination effect. No pun intended with the combination lock here. But anyway, the surface area of the feather is actually less than the, than the case, but the reason that we have a higher terminal velocity is when it's at terminal velocity, and that's kind of an important concept. And by the way, there is a posting for the video we watched yesterday on YouTube. Please make sure you watch it because it goes over these concepts and I will uh, take you through it briefly here. When an, object, when an object starts to fall, it is experiencing gravity downwards and a little bit of air resistance at first. So at this point, air resistance is very low. We're going to look at a skydiver. So this is a skydiver as they just jump out of the plane. So. Skydivers jump in, it's obvious, they're obviously moving downwards, and they obviously also have an acceleration downwards because gravity is larger than air resistance. So they are getting faster going downwards.
So getting faster downward. All right, now, at some point, and keep in mind that um, since, since V is increasing, since the velocity is increasing, R is increasing. Now, R can only increase to some maximum level. It's a type of friction, which means it can only resist so much and only resists as much as it has to. There's going to be a point where R is going to be exactly equal and opposite to gravity. And we call this situation terminal velocity. This is where the object has established its maximum speed. It can't fall any faster. Terminal velocity for your skydiver at first was 55 meters per second. It's pretty pretty fast terminal velocity. Terminal velocity for smaller objects is obviously less. We get into y when we use that equation. So terminal velocity is when the force of gravity is equal to air resistance. They have to be equal and opposite. This is moving at a constant velocity. And something to really keep in mind here is that it is moving. It is definitely still moving. The forces are equal and opposite in equilibrium, if you will. But it is still in motion. It still has some velocity heading downwards. Now the next situation is we have the person deploy their parachute. At this moment, our resistive force is much greater than the force of gravity because we've increased B. So R is larger. That's kind of a tricky thing. As soon as we increase B, we increase the resistance. Now, the object is still moving downwards. It still has a velocity downwards. But the net force is pointing upwards, which means there's an acceleration pointing upwards. In this case, it means they will slow down. They will slow down in this case, because the acceleration is opposite of the velocity. That's a very key concept. Acceleration is opposite of velocity. They will slow down. And that's why you tend to deploy the parachute when you're skydiving, because you want to be falling at a lower terminal velocity. Keep in mind that once you deploy the parachute, the object is going to slow down, but the resistance is also going to decrease, because keep in mind that R is equal to BV. And as the velocity decreases, the resistance decreases. So the object will just keep slowing down and slowing down and slowing down until, again, we have a new terminal velocity. So that's kind of an interesting thought to have. I'm going to go over question 11 and 12 in the review packet. I'll go through these with you. Uh, please do ask any questions you have. So 5 kilogram ball, so that means the mass is 4.5 I'm sorry, 4 kilogram ball falling through the air. Well, if it's falling through the air, then I know it's got gravity going downwards and it's got a velocity heading downwards. And I know the mass. If there is air resistance, oops, I better include that in my diagram. Resistance opposes the motion. It has a value of 32, so I'll include that in my diagram. At this time, how fast has the ball, or how fast is the ball accelerating with direction? I have to somehow figure out the acceleration of this, uh, this object. Now, what I would think is, look back to this idea. The net force is equal to mass times acceleration. I know the mass, and I don't know the acceleration, though, but I could find it. So let's first off figure out what the net force is. Well, the net force is going to be the combination of these two forces acting on it. But unfortunately, I don't know the force of gravity yet, so I better calculate that. It's just m times g. So we take 4.50 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. And we're going to end up with 44.1 newtons. So we have 44.1 newtons downwards. Alrighty, well the net force is the combination of the two forces acting on it. So it's 32 newtons, which is upwards, plus my negative, because it's downwards, 4 to 4.1 newtons. And that's going to equal negative 12 newtons. Keeping in mind that I can only keep the shortest distance to the decimal point, and 32 is right on the decimal point, I can only have my answer right to the decimal point. This is a rule of sig figs for subtraction. And addition, really. Okay, so negative 12 newtons, which the negative simply means downwards, because I'm using down as negative in this case. Well, that's my net force. That's F net. Well, if that's F net, F net LC equals MA. So I could say 12, negative 12, that is, is equal to 4.50 times A 
4.5 kilograms. Sorry, I forgot my units. If I divide both sides by this, you will find that you get 2.7 meters per second squared. You could say negative, or I could also say down. There we are. That's the answer to number 11. To do number 12, we're going to look back at this exact same question, and I'm not really going to do any new work. I have no new calculations to do. As it says, when the ball reaches terminal velocity, okay, so at terminal velocity, resistance is equal to the force of gravity. What will the value of air resistance be? Well, the two have to be equal. I know the force of gravity is 44.1, so R must be 44.1 newtons. Because at terminal velocity, the forces are equal and opposite, allowing it to fall at a constant rate. Please let, you know, let me know if you have any questions on this. Thank you for your time.